and strike the who farted pose. Let's see, little mouth open. Anyway, um, yeah, so trying to match the featured image that was suggested or well required, frankly, by someone in the chat. So uh, thank you for that. Welcome everybody to week four, the final week of this class. It's been fun uh, chatting with you guys in the chat um, for the last hour. Um, that's, that has become a very lively place and a place I like to be before uh, starting to stream. Um, uh, and so good to see you guys. We had a um, some interesting things come up in the chat. One of them being, I think it was Jack's idea about doing a class at some point that involves groups where, where the participants, you guys, group together and the goal is to have some sort of short film created and finished by the end of that month. And I love that idea. It's it's aiming high for sure. I mean, coordinating, like you guys coordinating yourselves, um, me trying to figure out like how to best teach and guide you in just a short month. Um, while it's very possible to make a short film in a month, someone asked, re reference the Piero short, and if that could have been done in a month, and it absolutely could. I think it would have required, you know, 40 hour weeks, like full time for a month. I think that could definitely have been done. Um, that's to say, like, I don't know what you guys' schedule is like. The, the coordinating, the goal of creating a short film in a month is pretty awesome. Maybe it could be like a two month class, like a special situation. But regardless, I love the idea of that working together is always it. it it's more fun, you know, doing that kind of stuff uh, in general in life. And so that's going to be true in this learning environment. So I would love the concept behind it. And hopefully we can make that um, a reality. I'm going to give a lot of thought to that and try and, and make it for sure. Um, let me just stop this other stream. Uh, so great idea. And and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I uh, I am finding that planning classes takes a little bit more time than than maybe initially thought when I was when I was uh, coming up with the idea. So um, um, that one would be a big one. But yeah, I, I want to do that. That sounds like a really, really cool idea. Um, all right, so so this class, week four, um, is going to be about painting characters. We're going to transition off of the gray model and into um, uh, color. And that did not pause. There we go. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But as usual, we're going to go in back to week three to talk first and recap um, what week three was all about. So uh, my favorite submission is Jack. Uh, I think, yeah, okay, Jack, you again. Um, your Bianca model, um, it, it kind of blew me away. I'll be honest with you. The sculpture, I, I, I love that you really went all out. You know, I think you had one of the more extreme posed sculptures and and I respected that a lot. It did maybe give you a little bit of trouble, like with the coat in particular. I gave you a note that it, the character sort of got lost in the in the in the coat, like in general, and it was maybe hard to tell like exactly what she was doing. The hair spikiness, you know, um, had a cool effect. It didn't necessarily read like hair. Anyway, I gave you some notes on the concept, and then you turn it into this character, and it like shot up big time, in my opinion. Um, and you, the wireframe is one of the, if not the cleanest wireframes of, of all the submissions, the hair you nailed. And you mentioned that in the chat that, um, uh, you followed that hair tutorial and you clearly were able to apply the principle and got an awesome, awesome result. So I, I, yours was my favorite, just the level of improvement that I saw the jump, it was significant. And I see this character as totally something in like a professional pipeline based on my experience, like these this is the this this would fit in a professional pipeline. So it's professional quality, in my opinion. So great job. You have the eyes closed, super clean facial topology, really, really good stuff overall. Um, awesome work. So that one was my favorite. And then honorable mentions, Malholmesies, your one-legged Pete. I mean, you set the bar pretty high when you did the sculpture. And then to neutralize that, I feel like certainly would have taken a lot of work, and you did it. And I, I you posted the wireframe and also the rendered version. But I liked your, uh, I, I wanted to show your rendered version here because you you nailed so much of that detail. And I'm sorry, it's a small picture, but um, look at it in the community thread and you can see all the detail you still achieved in pure polygon retopology. And that is, that's awesome. That is, um, can be easy to like over or just glaze over those details and just make it very, very smooth. But so much detail that you maintained in your skull, in your uh, retopology. So that is awesome. Very high quality. Again, this is, 
um, like professional uh, quality in my opinion. So really good stuff. Um, Jake, your Indiana Jones. Um, I was really impressed with, with your ability to finish this character. I should also maybe take a step back and in general, anyone who was able to finish the, the neutralization and retopology phase this week, uh, my hat's off to you. You did better than me. I did not finish my character, did not um, manage my time or maybe underestimated how much time it would take. So any anyone who did finish, I have a huge amount of respect and applaud you for being able to do that. And Jake, yours was one of those that stood out to me as um, a lot of work that, that you managed to do this week. And your topology, there's a little bit of um, room for critiquing it, but in general, like it's really good and um, and thumbs up to you on the Indiana Jones. And then finally, you know, not everyone, uh, you had the choice to either do a retopology or um, or just maintain your sculpture and like polish that and push it as far as you can. And Ryan Brewer, um, I don't know if you're in here, but your Bob character, the dad who's taking a moment for himself, um, was really, really good. I liked it a lot. Love the detail you achieved, the level of cloth um, uh, form that you sculpted into it. Love the expression on the face. The, with your backstory, knowing where what kind of character he is and um, and now seeing everything about the sculpture to this point, it just it, they work together and they inform each other and it's really, really solid. So good job with that. And I was surprised only to my count, only like two or three people out of 13 or 14 um, actually went with the sculpture. I thought most of you would do that. Maybe it was a, I think it's maybe the easier route um, or less time intensive route. And um, most of you did go with the neutralization to retopology. So awesome. I mean, I was super impressed, especially after I was not able to do it myself. And I'm like, these guys, these guys are amazing in here. Guys and girls are amazing uh, in this class. So really good job. In that way, all of you um, who finished deserve an honorable mention. Um, and then a topology critique. I asked Malholmesy if I could critique his one-legged Pete, and he said yes. And um, if I'm honest, like it's really it's a really good topology. So I had to remember like why I asked you to critique it. But looking back, I'm going to give you some fine nitpicking kind of critiques, um, stuff that I I would have gotten um, at the studio and like kind of shook my head like seriously. But I'm going to give you that kind of stuff. Um, again, this is a really really good model, but. Let's take a look at your uh, sketch fab. And just again, these are fairly minor notes, but in the jacket, uh, if we look, well, there's a couple notes around this area, but if we look at the abdomen and the size of the faces compared to the faces in the clothing, both the pants and the jacket, there's a big difference. And number one, the abdomen, I don't think, since there's not that much detail in the abdomen, like, like uh, there's not too much shape changing, um, I, it maybe isn't justified to be so high density. Um, and so I would either, if there is detail, like if there's like, I don't know, if, if this old skinny guy has a six pack for some reason, like there's enough geometry to warrant that, but maybe he doesn't have a six pack. That would maybe make more sense for the character. And in that way, reducing the topology into the abdomen, you know, makes sense. Cause I think this is, aside from the face and like the hands, this is as dense as those areas and it doesn't really need to be. Um, and then comparing it to the the cloth, the clothing, like just a big difference in the size. So maybe increase the topology in the clothing. Maybe it could be as simple, honestly, as like subdividing at one level and then applying that as your base. Um, but just trying to keep the, that's, that's a minor note about keeping the, the face density a little bit more consistent. And speaking of the clothing and increasing that density, it would make a lot of sense to me if this character was simulated, the, the, the clothing was simulated uh, in the animation phase. And so we would need a lot more geometry to make a realistic simulation. All the more reason to subdivide it up one level and then um, apply it as the base. Um, but uh, also in the jacket, there's a couple you know, misplaced verts that are just kind of jutted off here where everything else is very straight, but then this one is kind of just knocked off to the side. So pushing that back over to the left, same with, the, I mean, to the right, and same with this one back over to the right, just, you know, making things smooth and clean. Um, having having this edge in particular, you know, be, be straight up until this point and then straight on the other side, like I would push this down to try and just smooth the lines out. Um, in those ways, very nitpicky. Um, uh, but 
in general across the model, I find myself when I'm polishing a topology, doing that stuff a lot, just slightly sliding verts and edge loops um, just to make it as, as even as possible. And there were a couple of, I remember, yeah, this one in the neck right here, just jutting off um, without much reason. It's probably just an oversight. And even when you smooth it, you know, like that's isn't that noticeable, but um, in, I would definitely have gotten that note uh, if I were to submit that in like the professional pipeline. So I'm kind of critiquing you in that mindset. Um, also, there's a little bit of penetration right here in the head through the cap, just barely. Um, so, you know, pushing that back in and making that, uh, making that, um, not penetrate. And was there anything else? I did want to commend your facial topology. I don't know if you have experience, uh, outside of this class or the courses in this class, but I mean, this is, this is a super clean facial topology. Uh, this is absolutely what I would have seen in a professional pipeline. So, um, seeing this, I'm like, you, you got some experience, don't you? But regardless, this is super high quality work. Um, really, really impressive stuff. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's much of a critique. Some more um, facial, uh, like uh, face size. You Like these right here under the pocket are stretched compared to the ones around it. Just as simple as taking this edge, sliding it up this way, and this edge sliding it up that way a little bit. Just meeting in the middle, splitting the difference. Um, you know, if instead of having these majorly stretched and these not stretched at all, let's reduce the stretch here and then increase the stretch a little bit there, kind of meet in the middle, even out the topology. That's the kind of idea. But um, overall, really, really nice stuff. Again, I had to kind of think back, like, why did I ask you for a critique? Because there's not much to critique um, and easily earned that A for this week. So yeah, there were, uh, I think some of those notes, maybe part of the reason was I, I, I saw those notes in a lot of people's um, submissions and hopefully y'all can apply that to your own model. Mal Holmes, you just served as one of the first to submit and and got that, that note and request for critique first. So um, yeah, okay, so that's a topology critique. Hopefully that was useful and some tips in there. Um, and let's see, okay, yeah, last thing is my progress with my character, John Dunn which uh, is proving to be more of a disappointment than, than, uh, than an achievement, I would say. But um, we'll jump over to Blender real quick and look at that because um, some tips did pop up during the process that I wanted to share. And um, let me just check real quick, see if we've got any questions going on. Um, it doesn't look like it. A lot of congratulations to Jack, which very well deserved. And... Um, Okay, I don't see any questions. You guys probably know by now, you've been doing it, but like adding the question prefix, very helpful to me, um, rather than just looking for question marks. Um, but uh, yeah, looks like we're just, we're all uh, listening right now, so that's awesome. Um, my progress, again, not super impressed with it. Uh, if we go over here, I'm not sure why that's there, but um, here's where I landed, and I've got my read topology layer here. So I did not even get to address all of my pieces. I focused on the clothing. Um, I finished neutralizing it. There were a couple more tweaks I made to the neutral version and ended up retopologizing a lot of clothing. And, uh, and if I select all of our mesh components and turn on the wireframe, we'll take a look at some of this stuff. And uh, so part of the disappointment is like, I loved, and I've, t I've mentioned this theme before, but like, the concept sculpt is way more interesting, you know, being um, posed, like having wrinkle detail and having a purpose. The neutral version is just boring to look at, especially when you have so much clothing because clothing, neutral clothing is just boring. Like there's nothing going on in it. And and once I realized like how much clothing I had, most of this character was clothing, I'm like, this is, this is lame and I'm running out of time. Um, so nothing, nothing impressive to look at. I mean, I love shoes and, uh, or feet. You guys know that by now. So like I spent a decent amount of time retopologizing the feet. I like the way those turned out, but I mean, clothing is nothing to write home about. And, um, and, but that does bring up the fact that as I was modeling the clothing, it made, I was trying to weigh like, would this character be simulated in the clothing or would it just be like a rig situation where it, it's, you know, skinned with the rest of the body and being so clothed i feel like it needed to be it would be simulated in that hypothetical animation pipeline environment and with that you know like i kind of landed on my especially the face sizes uh were not as tight as they needed to be like like here in particular those are just too big and they're not going to simulate that well so 
as I was telling my Holmesy, um, you know, it might be a good idea for me to, um, to let's see, do one level of subdivision and apply it like this. So it's going to be pretty dense, more dense than everything else, but that will be good for uh, simulation. And so that that would probably be a next step uh, continuing on with this. Um, let's see, in general, topology is very grid, you know, very uniform. That's kind of the goal. It also ends up being very plain looking. Same thing with the, the pants. Um, I, I feel like they would need to be simulated. It's 2018, cloth simulation should be way more common um, it is in, in feature films, but it's, you know, it's still not the greatest thing in Blender. So um, that's kind of where I landed. Like this should be simulated if it's going to be a high quality character. And uh, with that, I should have done a body underneath. Okay. So the cloth simulation needs a, a, a form, a collision object underneath, just like our normal bodies and um, giving something for the cloth to, to collide with. And um, I did not get around to that. Um, I have hands, that, but, but they're not connected right now. You can see if I hide the jacket, just empty space. So that's what I would do. Next step is create a body, a, a, as low poly body, body as I could while having enough geometry to deform properly. And, um, and uh, that would be one of my next steps. Um, clean, you know, adding topology for the, for the shirt. I probably would not model an entire shirt because that would mean for simulation, you, you would have the collision body underneath and then you would have the shirt simulated level one and then the jacket simulated level two and that's a little too complex. So I probably would just retopologize this portion and uh, let it just float there and be skinned to the armature. And then typical facial topology, typical, well, except I wouldn't need a mouth. So that would save me a little bit of time. And, um, you know, I've done facial topologies a lot. So, uh, those were some of the, um, that was some of the tips as far as if your character had clothing. Um, if I go back to the jacket, um, there are a couple other things as far as um, the floating geometry in the pockets. Let me go back to my base mesh. So this is something that comes up frequently, like buttons, for example, pocket details. Um, uh, what is it called? Like a boutonniere, if that was on there, if, you know, like if a tuxedo kind of thing. If you've got accessories, that need to be, that are part of a jacket or a piece of clothing, um, but it's not separate, like it needs to move with the fabric, then then what I remember from the from um, my professional days is, is that's fine for it to be floating, but it needs to correspond to vertices in the underlying mesh, right? And so this pocket is floating off of the surface. Let me try and select it, there we go. And that's okay as long as the edges match up with the underlying, um, with these verts right here. And I started to, like, the, the edges right here in the middle, whoops, those correspond pretty well. Man, okay, there's my selection. Those correspond well, but on the edges, not so much, um, because, you know, the art warranted that they they be thinner um, than, than the underlying mesh, but so like, I'm not sure if I sent this to the riggers that they would send it back. There's, it's very likely because being in the middle of this face, as it's deforming, the cloth could, uh, I mean, the pocket piece could just start to interpenetrate with the other surface. And that's the problem. But if, if you need to do these kind of details, just make sure that you correspond the floating geometry to the underlying geometry, right? So, and I, I, for, I kind of forgot that. It's been years since I've had to do that, but... Um, I forgot that until I was finished with the jacket topology. In hindsight, I would have, you know, made my topology line up with those details ahead of time, you know, kind of like this. Move the edge right there. I would have modeled the jacket with that in mind, and then that would have made it super easy to just create that, um, that topology off of the surface, like duplicate the faces and then make it float. Because if the, if the vertices align, then they can adopt the same vertex weights and all the deformation will be 100% perfect. So that's, that's one little tip, you know, if you're doing, if you're modeling uh, for cloth simulation, something to keep in mind with the floating geometry. And I'm trying to think if there's any other tips. Let's see if I'm missing any questions. Um, I don't, okay, question answered. Question, is there a body below the clothes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome. I think that's all. Oh, no, I did have one more tip. So the hands right here, um, I if you've listened to my streams or, or courses, you probably heard me complain how much I do not like uh, hands, modeling hands, and I don't like modeling ears, especially those two objects. For some reason, the feet never bother me to redo feet all the time. But hands, they're just very tedious. There's, you know, five individual fingers that that are slightly different from each other, but require a very similar topology. And so, um, anyway, it's time consuming and it's, it's, it's just, I don't like modeling hands. Same thing with ears, a lot of detail in the ears, but, but ears are never the focus of something, right? Like it's just, I need ears on the face to register as a face. And, um, but you know, it takes a lot of time just to, to achieve that purpose. That to say, these hands are copied from another model, pasted into the file, no big deal. Like, once you do it one time, just reuse that those pieces of geometry. I recommend doing that in a general sense, like with the ears too. Like there's no reason to, um, I'll sculpt them maybe, but there's no reason to like retopologize that if you've already done it once. That's my that's my opinion. I like to save time and building up a library even of like th this is a particular set of stylized hands. If I turn off, let's turn off the wireframe. Um, so this is from a stylized character. So like, you know, there's style to them. There's hard edges around the, the that run the length of the fingers, very, you know, flat looking um, knuckles. And I thought, you know, that fits the character pretty well. The hands aren't a big focus here. So let's just copy, paste them, good topology. And that takes, you know, a matter of minutes compared to um, retopologizing them by hand. Same thing with the ear. I mean, I haven't done the topology yet, but I will easily copy um, ear geometry and paste it in here. So that was the last thing I think I was gonna say about this model. Do not be afraid to, um, yeah, actually, I think these might be the same hands I used on the Pancake Hobo. They do they do look familiar, don't they? Um, but uh, yeah, so prime example, don't be afraid to reuse stuff. That is not, a, that's, that's not a problem. Um, let's see, a question from William Miller. What do six-sided poles do anyway? Maybe there's more context for that question. Oh, oh, I, so my Holmesy, I, I have on my model two or three, let me highlight this. On my model two or three, um, six star poles, is that a problem? It's really, so you know, if you can avoid um, six star poles or five star poles, um, that's good. Like that's the goal to avoid them. But if you have to have them, and, I, and what I mean by have to is like, if you're almost done with the topology or or you've got two pieces of topology, like like areas of the body that are very important and you've got those exactly how you want them. And then when you stitch them together, you end up with a six or five star junction. That's okay. Um, as long as it's in an unimportant place. For example, an ear, when I, when I was talking about stitching the ear, that's a great example because there's so much geometry that rarely will the geometry of my ear match up to the geometry of the rest of my head retopology. And so I might have to throw in a triangle to make it work or throw in a six, started ju six star junction um, pole or whatever. Um, and that's fine because the ear is not gonna be doing much, right? Um, and I would say that's a fine place to throw a, a, a pole like that. Uh, top of the head, anywhere on the head, like that's a good place for it because that's never gonna move. Um, places you do not want it are like around the mouth, around the eyes, around the cheeks, um, if you can avoid it at possible, there's always going to be at least one f like five star junction in the cheeks, just because that's uh, the nature of it. But um, if you can avoid them, that's that's the goal. But the whole point of of like you know around the shoulders, like extreme points of articulation, you do not want those kind of poles. They'll just give un unwanted results, both in smoothing and in um, like deformation. So. That's kind of, it's okay to have them as long as you put them in places where it's safe. That's that's the general principle. Um, uh, what makes them different from five-sided five -sided poles? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that it makes too much of a difference in terms of like uh, pinching or deformation or whatever, but all right. A uh, question from Omar. I will be doing a character for my nephew. It's like a superhero. Would you say I should make a body and his uniform on top of his body or should just be his uniform um, to be less complicated? So if it's a superhero, they tend to wear tights, right? Like spandex or, you know, body, really tight body formed leather kind of stuff. 
And in that way, I would not simulate it. Um, I mean, you're just getting into next level simulation, like on the new Spider-Man um, movies, you know, like there's a lot of VFX. Um, if you go on YouTube and, and look up like the Amazing Spider-Man VFX breakdown, you'll see that the that skin tight clothing on the, the digital Spider-Man is simulated. That's next level. And that's, I, I would say beyond Blender's capability. Um, and I don't even know how they deal with the with the sliding and the, the the wrinkles being so tight and stuff. I don't know. That blows my mind as far as simulation. But if you're doing that and the superhero needs, um, you know, tight clothing, I would just rig that. I would not worry about simulating it. And in that way, you know, you can just do what I'm doing here. You can lop the head off, let's see, just below the neckline of the shirt, right? Just cut off your body parts and that'll be fine. You don't need to simulate it. Um, all right, cool. All right, so that's, um, oh my gosh, it's already 30, 25 minutes into it. Um, all right, let's get back to the presentation. That's kind of where I landed on, on John Dunn, and I hope to go back and finish it, even though it is so boring to look at. Um, maybe he could, he could be animated for some reason for a CG cookie uh, marketing you know, thing or something fun. That would be, that'd be cool. Um, or put it on like a resource that would be fun so people could download it, rig it, and animate it themselves or something. Anyway, um, I'm disappointed that I did not get as far as some of you guys got um, this week. So I apologize, did not did not uh, do well with my time management. Um, so that's John Dunn's progress. Let's get into actually what week four is all about, painting our characters and why I think that's very important. Um, so this takes us from character modeling into character creation. Um, modeling being just building the shapes and leaving it gray. And then character creation takes us into a more fully realized version of that character with textures, with color. And um, because if you guys have been modeling for any amount of time, hopefully you, it will resonate with you the fact that a gray model often just is not enough. It's not satisfying enough. Um, for your creativity, right? I, I use this uh, character as an example. It's based on a creature box concept uh, called Elder Beast. And, um, and uh, they're amazing, by the way. If you haven't heard of them, check out their art. Follow them. They're incredible. And, um, and so, like, this creature, to me, stands out because while the gray model, I feel very good about it. I, I liked, I'm proud of this model. I think it was a good exercise, and I like what I accomplished. But... For example, in the eye, it's just a round sphere, and there's and it's lifeless, right? There's not an iris or a pupil, nothing. And then with a little bit of texture, add that black dot. All of a sudden, there's a direction to the eye, even though it's very small. There's a there's more life in that eye, and it simply can't be achieved correctly with the geometry. I can put in another ball or or with eyes in particular, you know, what I promote is when you're sculpting like a head head bust or something to like scoop out a dome for the iris and then uh, extrude a hole for the, the pupil. And all that does, it's not, it's not physically correct. It's just designed to give you um, sh like shader information, shaded shadow information to look like an eye. It's approximation. That's all it is. Um, but it should be textured, really. Like, that's, that's the best fulfillment. And then also, um, so anyway, eyes in particular are a really um, bad place for, for modeling only. And then with the spots on this character, to me, that's a distinguishing feature of, of the character's skin, a very important um, aspect. And those cannot be created well in geometry, like in, in just a gray model. Like, I would have to either cut in a line with like the crease brush or something, and that is not what's happening in the character. Like it's skin, it's it's part of the color pigment in the skin. It doesn't have any depth uh, geometrically. And so in these ways, I guess I'm just trying to tell you that like, trying to prove systematically that a gray model is not the fullest representation of the character. Um, texturing is where that happens, texturing and shading. Um, and someone in the class who knows this, Lord Humongous, um, what I loved about your work throughout the, the month is that you naturally, um, in your caricature, you put, you textured her. You textured um, Kristen Stewart slash um, Emma Watson. And, and that just brought so much life. Like considering the eyes, I would be willing to bet 
that those are just spheres and you painted the iris and the pupil. Whereas if it was just a sphere on a gray model, like it's dead, lifeless zombie eyes, common problem with pure modeling. Uh, and, and you painting that iris, it probably didn't take you very long. And uh, to you know, lay out some quick UVs, put that color on there, and it brings so much life to the character. Um, and then even in your mostly gray model of your, um, oh, I can't remember the name of this character, but uh, in in this, oh, it's like it's like a demon lady kind of thing. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but um, I noticed right away the detail you put, the texture detail around the eye, like the mascara and eyeshadow, and the pupil, and then the lips. That little touch makes her feel so much more human and relatable than if um, if it had been gray. And, and that little extra detail sells it much better. And so just to, to commend you and the power of texturing, like I love seeing that in your work throughout the week or throughout the weeks, um, plural. So um, hopefully you know what I'm talking about in terms of why textured characters are important. So let's talk about some points of also like if you're not completely convinced that texturing is a good thing and, and worthwhile, I, I feel like maybe I need to, when I started this presentation, needed to explain this be, because I've, I've known a lot of modelers who are like pure modelers. They don't, they don't dabble in texturing, like nah, it's all about the pure model, you know, gray form only, you know, and, and that, that's, that's fine. Like there are some, I mean, you know, like David famous sculpture, like there's no texture information Really, you know, like there's some marble texture information, but no, nothing to inform the shape. It's just all about the shape itself, the form of the of the of the sculpture, and that's fine. You know, like there's a, there's a reason for that. But um, I would just in the in the 3D world, there's so many gray models that kind of fall flat and aren't satisfying. Um, so I feel like I need to explain and kind of promote why why to pursue texturing. Um, so yeah, we've already described that they communicate more gray more than gray models. Um, let's see, just making sure I'm not missing anything in the uh, chat. Saw a bunch of things roll in. Um, okay, cool, I don't think I missed anything. Again, just put a question prefix if, if uh, you need to ask a question. Um, please do ask your question. Just wanna make sure I catch those till we get a better system for asking questions. Um, Okay, how weird is it to say crazy usernames out loud? <laughs> it's um, it's definitely different. I because it's L humongous and it looks like an I to me. So I just have I'm, it's based on like one memory of him saying his name one time, and I'm always nervous. Like, is that is that gonna be wrong? Or sometimes you know, like people's gender, I don't want to call him a her or vice versa if the username doesn't really make sense. Um, anyway, so it's kind of strange calling out usernames, but um, I'm really into the Melee stuff right now, like playing Melee and following those tournaments and stuff, and they like only talk in usernames, so I'm getting more comfortable with it. Um, William Miller, yours is not as crazy as some of the others. Um, it is helpful when you guys just put, put your regular names, but be creative and just be a username also. Um, all right, so textured characters also tend to stand out more than gray models, right? So if, if you have a demo reel, if you're if you're promoting yourself as a character artist and your demo reel has textured characters, I would bet money that that will stand out to an employer, stand out to the art community more than gray models. Um, it takes a very very special gray model to to do the opposite, to stand out more than a textured model. Um, and so, I, for me personally, I took this to heart in college whenever we started uh, creating our demo reels, our our, our um, started to market ourselves to become professionals and we had the last three months devoted to creating assets and creating a demo reel and they they encourage you to um to specialize right be a rigger and just do rigging stuff be an animator and just do that or modeling hard surface modeling vehicle modeling like specialize and almost everybody did a bunch of gray models in in the character and modeling modeling field and I just thought that was such an easy opportunity to like, okay, well, I'll texture mine then. And it, and it worked. Like, I mean, it, um, it's, it stood out. I, I, got, I mean, it got recognized and, and without a doubt led to my first job. Um, and so like, it's just an easy way to stand out and, and sell your characters more. Um, uh, practically speaking, it can take the pressure off of your modeling. Like if you consider, if you don't separate modeling and texturing as two different things, 
but you put them together, you know, you can decide during the modeling process like, oh, this particular detail will look better as a texture. And um, so I don't need to model it. I don't need to take the time to model it. Um, a prime example, I think, is uh, the eyes right here. Um, you know, be, thinking like, I'm going to texture this, you can just leave it a sphere. Whereas me, when I don't texture the sculpture, I'm like, I have to model the iris, model the pupil. That's a, a small example. Um, but it can, if they work together, they can, they can make your workflow more seamless and they can, um, um, what is the word I'm trying, they can collaborate rather than be separate things. Um, when you're just focusing on modeling, you gotta, you gotta consider every detail and often build those details into the model when maybe a texture could take care of it. Um, also, as, as a marketable artist, it does mean you're more robust. It, you're a character artist, not just a character modeler. And, um, you know, in a studio environment, an example I want to talk about is you can jump departments. So my brother is also a 3D artist and we worked together for a while at Real Effects and he was primarily a modeler, but on his demo reel, he had texturing and they hired him as a texture artist. And he was a little nervous about it because he would, while he could texture, he would not consider himself primarily a texture artist. And, but he, he did it, he was able to do the job and he did really well. And then when another project started up and the texture department was kind of lax, you know, and not doing anything, he was transferred to the modeling department and he was able to model. And then when that was done, he was able to transfer back. Whereas um, other people who are just specialized, like they weren't as valuable as that. They couldn't be transferred. And, and so he did really well um, with, with having both sets of skills and doing them quite well. You know, if doing two sets of skills really, really well is not, is not impossible. Um, if you want to be a generalist and do rigging and animation and texturing and modeling, that becomes quite difficult to do everything well. Um, anyway, all that to say is you're more robust, both in the studio environment, but also as a freelancer. Like if you want to, if you want to find jobs as a character artist, um, that's going to make you more valuable than someone who I can just do modeling and then you have to find someone else to do textures. Um, I, I just know plenty of people who do that as well. Um, and I think they limit themselves. Um, but anyway, all right, so hopefully I've convinced you if you, were, if you were doubtful about the importance of textured characters and maybe I was just trying to explain and justify myself like why I've never been satisfied with just gray models. Um, but this gets us into the types of texture painting. Uh, first is shadeless texture painting. This is very similar, this is exactly the same actually as 2D painting, like illustration, Photoshop painting, but it's on a 3D model, okay? so. What I mean that they're the same is that in two-dimensional illustration, you don't get anything for free, right? Like you don't get shading information, re uh, reflections, um, ambient occlusion, you get nothing for free. So what you paint, what you see is what you get. What you paint is what you get. And in that way, shadeless texture painting is exactly the same. Um, all right, let me ask some, answer some questions. Got a couple, saw a couple pop up here. Um, let's see. Would from William Miller, would you texture your models in substance? What about sculpting them in ZBrush? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and make any any software biased, you know, promotion. Um, I mean, obviously we teach Blender here and I love Blender personally, but that's not to say, I mean, Substance is an amazing app and um, I've never used it personally. I mean, part, partly because, you know, I'm a Blender teacher. I wanna be able to, to teach these things in Blender. Um, but ZBrush was the first app that I bought, the only app I bought out of college. That's the only professional 3D app that I, I ever bought. I was never able to afford Maya and quickly switched to Blender. But ZBrush I could afford and, and I still have it and um, very powerful sculpting. So I would, I mean, I would do that if, if, the, if the situation called for it, like a super high res sculpt for some reason. But I haven't done it in years. Um, but uh, there's nothing wrong with it. And we have people taking this class, I believe, sculpting in ZBrush instead of Blender. Um, so it's all, it's all good. Um, I do envy Substance as a texture painting software because um, if I'm brutally honest, I think Blender lags behind, especially compared to Substance. And there's a lot of room for improvement with Blender's workflow. And you'll probably see that firsthand today during the demonstration, but um, we'll get there. Um, and so, yeah, so the shadeless texture painting uh, again, there's no light, no shadow information, no specular information, just pure painting an image onto a 3D model. And this is very popular and has been for many years for uh, game development, game games. 
and um, because no shading information means your you know your game can run more efficiently. And so as we can see with this character, the Melvin character from the uh, Eat Sheep iOS game from a few years ago, uh, everything here, all the shadow information, the ambient occlusion, like that is baked into the model. And um, and it looks really good. You know, it almost looks shaded. A, a good texture will, will kind of confuse you. It'll be an illusion where it looks shaded, like there's, you know, specular highlight on the eye. It's like, okay, that eye looks shiny, but it's really just a white dot. It's not shiny at all. And a good texture painter will be able to make it look, feel 3D, you know, like have that kind of shading information, but not breaking down as soon as the animation starts. So for Melvin, like if he lifts his arm, this model, if he lifts his arm, that ambient occlusion will stick to the arm and it'll look weird, you know? Um, but if you are able to meet in the middle and kind of split the difference, um, then it can be a very effective strategy for, um, for texture painting and, and games especially. Um, a couple more questions. Does the texture artist also have to do shading or material creation in the studio? Good question, Omar. Um, and without, and I'm definitely not mentioning any, any names, but I remember also being a little disappointed with the, so the way it worked at, at uh, in my experience is you do the model and then you pass it on to both rigging and then texturing at the same time. So they're both working on it next. And the texturing department um, you know, they would post, you know, we had this system where you post updates or renders, you know, like as you progress. And like, generally, I was always disappointed with the texture painting process because to me, it was clear that they were not responsible for the shaders. Like they would do a generic shader and plug in the maps, but it never looked great. The texture painting, they were very good painters, but like, I feel like they were not responsible for the shaders as well. But then once those textures made it into the compositing and render and well the lighting team, which I think they were they did lighting, rendering, and compositing like all together. Um, when it got to them and they were more in charge, based on my observation, they were more in charge of the shaders. And so yeah, like in that particular studio environment, I don't think the texture artists were responsible for the tight shader integration. And um, um, which you know could could lead to problems, I think. Um, I, I would, if, if I had a studio, I would want my texture artist to be very um, uh, versed in shader creation as well. Um, let's see. William, I think the classes should be more linear going from the beginner class to sculpting characters is quite a large jump. Yeah, no, that makes sense. If you see, if you see the classes as being like last, like January leads directly into this month, um, this class, then yeah, that that that's definitely what's happening. I don't mean for it to be like that. I what I envision for classes is like a random, at least right now, unless unless it it ends up being a bad idea and, and I should readdress it. But like, I see the classes as being random, right? Like giving giving any anybody at, at, at like that's a part of CG Cookie, um, especially citizen members, at any one point, you know, like random months they could learn advanced character art. And then the next month, the beginners can learn beginner stuff. And then the next month, intermediate riggers can learn about rigging. That's kind of how I see it happening. So so this class is not meant to be a direct jump from January, not at all. But rather, I knew I had advanced people in January sticking around, giving very helpful advice, even participating. So this month, I wanted to give them something. Um, but I don't know, that's an interesting concept of like, should all of my classes be linear, you know, like, um, I mean, because it there's an argument for that, but that's not how I envision it at this point. Um, any more questions? Oh, from Evan, do you use a uh, software like Krita or Krita and or Photoshop to texture UVs? Um, um, yes, it, not I like Krita. I just haven't spent as much time, but um, Photoshop I do use fairly regularly. Um, typically my 3D painting, my 3D texture painting workflow s exists more in 3D. So like I try and paint my textures in Blender rather than do it in a 2D application. Um, there are times where I will, I know in some of my training, especially my older training at, on this, on CG Cookie, has me jumping into Photoshop and, and doing some like base texture work or certain texture uh, tasks in Photoshop. In the last few years, I've been trying to do it all in Blender, um, but I love I love the possibility of Krita. I just haven't taken the time to really learn it um, as well as I should, or well as I want to. Um, 
So William, yeah, I want to learn linearly and participate in every class. Um, I, I, I mean, what do you guys think? Is there, can, do you guys have an opinion, people who are watching, like, uh, by the way, I'm wondering how many people are watching. Okay. Um, do you guys want to see like a more linear class where this month's class leads into, let's see, March, May's class and then into July's class? I think they could work if we're running some um, running simultaneously so people could pick where they could fit better. Right. Yeah. That, see, that's maybe what I think is, is a tall order is to expect like a lot of people to maintain that schedule. Like even this class, we've had people start and then life happens and takes them out of the, the class and they, they can't, they can't take the time. And, um, and if it was a linear curriculum overall, okay, random is cool. Um, if it was a linear class overall, like I couldn't tell those people, well, well we're gonna, I'm gonna rerun this class in a few months or something. It's like, oh shoot, well, you know, I, I gotta take the, the everyone else all the way through to like from beginner to advanced stuff. And I'm gonna be doing that for the next year or so. Sorry, you know, you miss out on, on this class and I'm not gonna readdress it. So. That's a problem with it is trying to get everybody in on the same same schedule. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's a reason against it, maybe. Um, okay, so we got another one. I just joined classes, so I don't mind not linear. Okay, I have no opinion either way. I approach the self serve courses in a linear, but with the random classes are fine. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Man, I wish I could make everybody happy. That's something that seems ever apparent is you can't always make everyone happy. I'm sorry, William. I think you're not alone. We are with you, but um, I don't know. I'll, I'll think about the linear classes and, and I mean, maybe the, that class or the class we talked about being a month where you make a short film, like that would be every subject, you know, not necessarily from beginner, but that would be every subject in a single month. So that might 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 solve some of that for you, but we also do have our our, our learning flows that you know pre-recorded training that is meant to um, take you linearly from beginner to uh, advanced. So you know that's kind of more for that purpose. Um, all right, cool. So we've talked about shadeless texture painting. Let me take my jacket off and then get a sip of water. Um, sorry about this. If you guys don't have water on hand, that's not fair. I want a B spine, a B spline class format. Oh, nice. Um, I like the CG humor injected. Um, so we got, we talked about shadeless texture painting, um, the most direct form of texture painting. And then we have shade full texture painting, which is a silly way of like shader based texture painting. Um, this is much more complex. It requires multiple textures um, to be either painted or baked and a list of examples, and this is not the full list, but you know, diffuse albedo, uh, which is mainly like a color. It's, it's the most close, it's the closest form of like, of the shadeless. And then um, uh, so you've got specular, which is like defining how shiny, uh, it, how reflective um, parts of the, of the character are. Um, then you've got metalness or glossiness. This defines for those, shi for those reflective areas, like how reflective is it? Is it is it cl how clear are the reflections? Is it um, you know mirror mirror clear or is it you know rough? Uh, that that map defines that. You got your ambient occlusion, um, an ID mat, a subsurface scattering maps, which often is like three different maps: backscatter. Um, oh, I forgot. It's been a while, but it's, there's backscatter, epidermis. A subdermal and epidermal layers is typical for subsurface. And then emission, like this is just a quick list, but a big list because once we get involved with the materials and our textures are involved in in influencing materials, it just, the, the complexity, you know, is, is uh, um, expounds, I, um, exponential, wow. Um, so that's why this is much more difficult. And it's also not direct, right? Like even your color map, you're not painting like a painter paints. Okay, that was a lot of versions of the word paint. So, you know, a painter paints exactly what they want. If they want somebody to be specular, they put a white dot on it. They put a reflective mark. If they want shadow, they paint it darker. 
That's not at all the case when you're painting a diffuse or albedo map. In fact, you want to paint the essential color information without all of that stuff. And that's kind of a mind game, right? Like, especially for a painter, you know, like who's traditionally a painter, that's just weird to think about. It's, it's not a direct form of painting. And also then you gotta, to judge if the texture is working, you gotta plug it into a material and judge it that way, judge it in pieces. Anyway, so the shader, shader based texture painting gets a lot more complex. And, um, and so for this particular demonstration today, now let me not go there, not quite yet. Um, personally, this is how I've always done it. I've always done shader based texture painting. It's what I mostly, it's basically all that I teach on CG Cookie. Um, there's one course about creating a rock game asset that I don't do it so much. But um, so this is this is what I typically do. And what it, ma it makes me less of a painter and just more of like a utilitarian texture artist, which is fine. I mean, it, it, it does what I've always wanted it to do. But I kind of envy this approach, the shadeless texture painting. I I think I lack very much as a painter, as, as like someone who can can color pick things and understand to paint a dark, a, a color in shadow is not just adding black. It's, you know, it, it's picking a different form of that color. I don't know. It's much more complex than I've ever thought. And I want to get better at it. So I, in recent years, I want to learn how to do this stuff better. Um, you might want to do this stuff more. It might be vice versa, but it, it, either way, I felt it necessary to divide and explain these two differently um, and what is so different about them. So, um, so the week four agenda, the goal, I try to, I think it should be as simple as possible because I don't think texturing is our, is what collectively is our main thing. Lord Humongous, you might be a little better at it since you have been doing it already. Some people have been doing it already too, but um, for me, it's, it's not as natural. And so I'm kind of assuming that about you guys. And so the point of this, this week is to get more comfortable painting textures and also to finish your character. This is the final week. Um, I, I, envisioned that from week two to four would be you creating the same character and then at the end boom we have finished renders that we can put on our website put in the CU cookie gallery uh, maybe even put it on a demo reel if that's what you're into if that's what you're aiming for um, but yeah finishing our character that's a big goal of this week as well uh, the training to watch uh, basics of digital painting um, this is a concept course and and it, you know it is using photoshop so um you will need to do some translation for getting that those concepts over to Blender, but the tools allow for it. And what I want you to focus on is ideas like blending colors, uh, color picking and understanding more color theory, like just getting into the mind of a painter. Um, uh, for one, because like that's, it's more of that shader, um, I'm sorry, shadeless type of texturing. Um, so I wanted to give you a concept art course actually, and then make you, or ask you to watch another one whether it be the color theory course or um, one of the character painting courses, whatever, just to get you some experience painting traditionally, like with no shader information, no lighting information, just focus on painting. Even if it doesn't come to you naturally, like to have done it will be a benefit to you. And then finally, the texturing and shading a stylized character, that's the second form that's texturing entirely for shader purposes. And it's more of a utility painting, um, rather than an artistic painting in a way. Um, so those are the training uh, courses to, to watch this week, to lean on. Uh, and in the homework assignment, do the axe texture painting exercise. That's from Lampel, Jonathan Lampel. He does very good. That's an awesome exercise. And it's a cool asset to practice on. So do that exercise. It's also completely shaderless, I believe. Um, so it's, it's more in the painting realm. And um, if you can't tell, I, I am trying to push more of, for this class, like, hand painted textures is kind of what I'm trying to push. Um, and then, so do that exercise, post a link in the submission and uh, also paint your character sculpt or your, your either your sculpture or your um, neutralized model um, and present a final render or viewport screenshot of your character. That can be neutralized or it can be your sculpture. Uh, but um, yeah, just do like a, a fairly pretty render, um, a presentation render kind of is how we're gonna finish it up. All right, let me run through some questions. I believe that I am missing some, some communication opportunity. So let me check. Let's see. Oh, we got a Blender animated film in here. Very cool. 
Um, don't see any questions actually. All right. Let's see. Can we? T okay. Here's one. Can we have two more days to finish the textures? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, so, um, I, I I know better than ever before how lofty my expectations and the assignments are for you guys. So yeah, like technically the class is going to end, you know, at the end of this week or at the end of the March. I forget how many days that is left. Um, th three or four or something like that. So. Yeah, like I'm going to I'm going to I'm not going to close out that I'm not going to unpin that thread from the forum until you know the first week of April is over. So like take your time, paint your textures. Let's aim for like an extension for the for the end of the first week in April to be able to like submit and I'll keep checking on that thread um, because I do know that I asked a lot of you guys and and you've come so far, I would hate for you to end on like halfway painted char characters. So yeah, please hopefully use that extension um, and uh, we'll, we'll see some finished characters in there. That would be pretty awesome. Um, anything else? Question, what are your thoughts on Blender add-ons for modeling or improving workflow? Let's see, for Blender modeling, actually I don't have a lot of ideas. I think that the Retopo Flow add-on that um, Jonathan Williamson is, is uh, you know, developing um, that's a really amazing retopology tool set, and I do a lot of retopology, so that would be important to me. Um, but like, I think Blender's modeling tools are pretty great, and even into sculpting, like really good sculpting stuff. Um, texture painting, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. And B Painter, for, I think it's B Painter from, oh, I can't remember his name, Andreas or something like that. Um, that tool looks amazing. It looks like he's taking a more Photoshop approach to layers and painting in Blender. And that one, I, I uh, support him on Patreon. And again, like I have that add-on, but I haven't used it because I want to be able to teach people out of the box Blender. But texture painting, I have a lot of maybe opinions on how that can be improved. Um, too many for for this, uh, uh, for just answering right now, but I'm gonna when I get into the demonstration today, like you'll we'll we'll see some some shortcomings of, of Blender texture painting. Would it be okay if I attempt to texture your creature from the creature course and rig it? Yeah, yeah, sure, go for it, um, Zach. If uh, I don't know if I can't remember if you've been like participate if you like had a character come this far. If you have had a character and you've been, you know, sculpting it to retopologizing it. I would love to see you finish your character. If you don't have one, feel free, grab the creature from that course and and, and absolutely texture it up. Do it up. Do you recommend Sculptor's Toolbox by Jim Morin? I haven't used Sculptor's Toolbox, but I know Jim uh, Morin is a very good artist and what he makes is I would say is very valid. Um, is very good. So, without having used it, I mean, chances are it's a really good add-on. Question, uh, do you recommend, the oh, sorry, oh, that's fine. Um, uh, I appreciate you you catering to me and, and, and uh, doing me a, a solid with the question prefix. Um, another question, is lighting, beauty shot, camera placement, co com composition renders worthy of a fifth class? A fifth week class. You, yeah, it's totally worthy of it. Um, and in, in the creature, in the creature course, I, I, there's a chapter about presentation it's not a ton of compositing or anything, but um, it's worthy of it. But you know, like classes have this four week format. You know, I feel like it. I feel like four weeks more people can commit to four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. It starts to get a little quite out of hand, maybe. Um, even even in the four weeks, like we we've had, we're down to like thirty six percent of the of, so people. All the people from week one who submitted homework, only thirty six percent of those people are continuing to submit homework. So that's normal, like to see a fall off. And, and uh, I don't know, I don't want to give people more reason to fall off in the fifth week, I guess. But I mean, we should do, I should totally do, or someone, um, it'd be awesome if we got Sean Kennedy to do a course about compositing in Blender, or a class. That would be, that would be fire. Um, let's see, one more question, then we'll get to the demonstration. Is there a big difference between Blender internal versus cycles for texture painting? Um, the only difference, in my opinion, the biggest one is how it's set up. You know, like with, with Blender Render, it involves like assigning the UVs to the model. Or no, 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 now it's like 
texture slots, whereas in, yeah, that's what it is. It's texture slot based. And that's pretty good. Um, it's okay. Uh, it, but then in cycles, you like whatever texture you have selected in the node editor, like whatever texture node is selected, that's what you're painting in the viewport. And that's a little weird to me. I, I tend to paint textures with Blender Render and you'll, you'll see that today. That's what I do. But um, I mean, I don't know that one's better than the other one. Frankly, I think both of them are not great. A um, lot of room for improvement. Um, a reason why I'm supporting the B Painter add-on. I think it could really revolutionize texture painting in Blender. Um, cool. All right, so I think I've caught up on the questions. Thank you for asking those. Don't, um, again, like this is a very welcome place for questions. Uh, so we'll get into the demonstration and I'm, let me grab Blender. I am a little worried so I also should say that I, since I'm a little bored with this neutralized version and I didn't finish it, um, so I'm trying to weigh like what will be the most satisfying result for me in this character in this last week of the course or the class is um, I'm not going to texture this guy uh, because it's just, it's not finished enough. And I think the sculpture is way more satisfying to me. So if I open up the concept sculpt number eight. I am going to try and, and paint this. I'll, and so, you know, as I'm going with you guys through the course, I'm now like jumping into the boat with, uh, with the sculpture people who like focused on the sculpture for week three. Uh, all these principles though, like, all, I mean, primarily the painting stuff, which is what I want you to take away. Like it is, um, well, even the baking stuff too, like that's relevant to if you're, if you're texturing the neutral version. Like as I texture this, it's, it's like, throwaway textures in a way, right? I mean, I'm never going to, they're never going to be properly UV'd or anything. It's just trying to get paint on this sculpture as if it was clay and as if I had some acrylic paint beside me just going to town. Um, that's kind of how I'm going to paint this sculpture. And, um, oh, interesting. 3D coat is basically the Photoshop of texture painting, same kind of interface. You know, I, um, I've never heard, I've only seen huge 3D coat fans like that love that software, but I don't run into many people who use it. So I've actually used it before to do um, some auto read topology. I think they had a tool before ZBrush really did. And, um, uh, but I've never used it for texture painting. It's a very good app though. I've never known why it hasn't exploded really in popularity as far as, far as I know. Um, let's see, my volume is at max, but I hear Kent really low. Um, let me check OBS real quick. Testing, test, oh my goodness. So I did have the mic pointed elsewhere. Um, now it's pointed at my face. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, one day, one one year, maybe I'll be, I'll be super pro at streaming, but um, I'm still a little, a streaming baby right now. Um, uh, oh, because you have to pay for it. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I don't think it's expensive. I think you're talking about um, what were we just talking about? 3D coat. But um, yeah, I don't think it's that expensive. <laughs> Fired. All right, so we're. I'm gonna get into texture painting this guy. And I, even though I did rehearse yesterday, uh, um, I should admit that like I, I kind of already have the fact that I usually texture for for shaders. Um, I'm not going to do that here. I'm, I'm mainly going to try and texture in a shadeless form. And I just kind of like a game art. I think that that's going to make this feel the kind of stylization that I want. So I'm going to focus on that. And it's not my strong suit. I'm kind of taking the plunge that I maybe hope some of you guys take if you're uncomfortable with, with hand painted textures. I'm taking that plunge today. And so this is another raw kind of stream. I did rehearse, but I mainly learned what not to do more so than what I learned what to do. Um, so just bear with me. I hope this doesn't turn into a complete failure, but, um, hopefully you take some things away. Uh, some things that I, I, I know to start out with is trying to make this model a little more efficient for, for the painting process. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess now it's too loud. Um, <laughs> sorry guys, you'll have to dial it back down. My bad. That is completely on me. Um, I apologize, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, so this model right now, I'm at 700 and seven, 772, what? 
772,000 faces. For some reason, I couldn't remember how to say that. Um, so I'm getting close to a million, and it's gonna make some of our processes a little slow, like uh, like map baking and texture UV layout. Um, so I wanna make this, even though it kind of pains me, I'm uh, if I were not streaming this and trying to avoid blowing up my computer, I would try and do this stuff as I did yesterday. I do it at this highest resolution, but since, um, you know, for example, I'm gonna do smart UV project and that took like four minutes um, just to UV project. Uh, and if I don't do it right the, per the first time, like that's a very boring four minutes. So I am going to, and you might find this, um, what you need to do with your own sculpt, I'm gonna dial it down a bit and try and get the geometry a little lower, like between 100 and 150,000 uh, polygons. Um, also, let's think through the fact that I have these shoes that are mirrored. Well, it's a duplicate. So I can, um, uh, I'm gonna lay out the UVs for this shoe. I'm gonna paint the texture and then duplicate that so that I get that texture for free. I think that's the only thing that I can get for free in the texture painting process. So um, I'm gonna select all the geometry and hit Alt-C to convert it to a, oh wait, actually, since this thing is so under underdone, I'm not. I'm just gonna delete this. I uh, I didn't even get to finish modeling. You know, like I'm just such a scrub whenever it comes to leading by example. So I'm just gonna delete that and you know lose some elements, some very cool elements of the character. But just try and consolidate this to the finished pieces. And um, let's see. Question: Why don't you use vertex paint mode? When I created the course, when I created the class, created the syllabus, I entirely intended to do that, um, to paint this like vertex paint, just like poly paint for ZBrush. I, I intended that. And then when I started playing around with it, the vertex paint, as far as I could tell, is is actually a different system than, than the texture paint. Like the projection and stuff is different. And so it made it, it made it hard to, to, te to texture it the way I wanted, to paint it the way I wanted. Um, and that's why I'm not using it. Um, but I don't know, I, maybe I was doing it wrong. I'm not sure, but that's why I, I reverted back to just texturing, laying out kind of a quick and dirty UV and then just texture painting because I'm more familiar with that that mode. Um, uh, so what I wanna do, the whole point of this is I'm going to combine my mesh into one object and and paint it that way. So I can lay all the UV out, if I can lay all the UVs out at one time, I can, uh, like jump into texture paint on one object and like, you know, select the different pieces. It's just gonna be a little easier to work with. So in order to do that with this sculpture, I'm going to select all my objects, hit Alt C to convert to a mesh. And the reason I did that is to collapse the stack on, on these objects that were poly polygon modeled. So now they're all, um, you know, like uh, collapsed down to their basic form or this is the new basic form, control J. So when I join them all together, I get exactly what I want, right? If I join those before I alt C converted it, then this, this sword would have gone down to the low poly version. Um, but as it is combined, I'm gonna select this hand since it's uh, inverted and I need to um, select that whole thing with control L or just L and uh, select the island and then Let's go to shader UVs and flip the direction. And also since, um, you know, this is such a high res mesh, almost to a million, like, and I'm streaming, it makes this process very slow. So another reason to just try and decimate this, which is what I'm gonna do next. So select our object, let's turn off only render. And we're going to add a decimate modifier. Would be, oh, uh, it's from Zach, I think, Vertex paint would be more for a cartoony solid color or look. Well, and that's what I was gonna go for actually. That's what I'm still gonna go for is is a a cartoony um, shadeless version. Um, oh gosh. Um, so yeah, anyway, like vertex paint in theory should have worked if the workflow wasn't, or if the, if the tool itself wasn't a little different, was a little too different from texture paint. So I've got my decimate on um, oh man, so we, we're leaving, I think Char is, is heading out. See you, Char, thanks for being here. Um, uh, I enjoy talking to you. You're always here and talking, so thanks. Um, decimate modifier has been added. I'm gonna add, let's go to like 
0.2 for the ratio. Hopefully this doesn't take forever. And let me know if, if the stream starts stuttering because of the processing of, of what I'm doing in Blender. Um, let me know that. Love how friendly everybody is in here. You guys are awesome. All right, so I've got it down to 0.2, which takes me to 138,000 faces. I think that's good. The form, you know, it's definitely simplified, but the main forms are still there. And I think that's gonna be good for painting because remember, it is gonna be shadeless. That's what I'm planning on. And so the geometry and the intricate details become a little less important in the shadeless version. So we'll apply that and we have a more efficient mesh to work with. By the way, this decimate approach, combining your model, you don't necessarily have to combine the model, but if you wanna run one almighty decimate modifier, uh, combine your model and um, decimate it this way and you can upload it to Sketchfab a little easier. Someone was asking like my, my uh, you were saying that uh, you couldn't get your model on Sketchfab because it was such a big file, but if you decimate it, um, it, it maintains most of its detail depending on how low you go with that ratio and it makes it more uploadable to Sketchfab. So um, that's how I get the, got my model, this model onto Sketchfab as well by decimating it. So it's decimated now, we're at um, actually 212 faces. So I guess uh, public service announcement, the decimate modifier value is not 100%. Wait, actually it's because this shoe, I'll bet. If I delete that shoe, okay, I take that back. It's not a um, approximation. It looks like it is the right number. So um, that shoe is gonna be gone, but I'm just leaving it there for right now. Uh, now that I've decimated it, let's try laying out UVs. And this is gonna be a very quick and dirty smart UV project. Um, so uh, select all my mesh elements in edit mode, U, smart UV project. And the angle limit, I don't, you know, I don't mess with this too much. I don't mess with hardly anything except the island margin, um, just because I think the default settings are good. And I and I never use this other than a quick and dirty UV layout. And with that, I know it's not gonna be perfect. So just, you know, I, I leave the settings as is, except for the island margin. I think I need to put that at 0.01 if I recall correctly. Um, so I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna press okay. And hopefully this only takes about a minute and, um, if you guys have questions for that minute, I'll be happy to answer them. But um, question, is there a, thank you, Matthew. Uh, is there a masking technique with the decimate modifier to protect areas of the model? I think there are. I think so. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so, oh, I'm gonna answer you, Zach. Um, oh, it only took a little bit. Nice. Sorry, I just went down two rabbit, I just lost my train of thought twice in a row. Okay, I'm gonna pause right there on the UVs. Uh, so Matthew, um, I think that there is, let's test that. Decimate. Yeah, okay, right here, this vertex group, that's how you can mask it. If you have, um, um, add, your, add certain vertices, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think how it would work. Uh, vertex group name collapse only. So you need to add a vertex group and, and add vertices or faces to that vertex group that you don't want decimated. It's either that way or it's reverse. So select the areas that you want and uh, to, <laughs> let's just try it, let's try it. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's say I really want to leave the head as is, but I want everything else to decimate. Okay, maybe you don't need this explained, um, the old vertex group trick, yeah. So this is a common thing in Blender about how to mask things with vertex groups. So yeah, if, that, if that's making sense to you, then I won't, I won't worry about the demo. Uh, random question, when is the next film review stream? Not that I don't love these streams, but I really like the film reviews. I'm glad you say that. I, I hoped people would like those, but um, I think they've been maybe our, uh, maybe our least popular um, streams. So interpreting that to maybe people don't love them. But to hear that is good. We, we like those and we want to do, I mean, maybe we'll do another one in April um, this coming month. Uh, I need to fill out that schedule, by the way. A lot of, lot of ideas, but I need to officially get that on the schedule. Um, so don't let the empty schedule fool you. Uh, but maybe we'll do one next April, uh, next April, uh, this coming month. And, um, and yeah, I mean, do you have a vote for which film to do? I mean, typically we do it with, uh, with we've been doing it with the, 
Blender Foundations films, but um, if there are other Blender films you'd like, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, offer a suggestion. I, we're, I'm definitely open to it. Um, random question. A uh, question: How about a live stream in which members critique your courses? <laughs> um, that. I mean, so like we get like constantly, like weekly, I'm, we're getting critiques from people through uh, through comments on the site, through intercom, um, which is the orange plus button in, in this in the thing. Uh, that would be kind of, I mean, it'd be like it'd be like a roast. I feel like, and that could be kind of fun. Um, but uh, any oh, so the the did the stream with Captain Del- Disillusion fall apart? No, it did not. I need to. I told him that I would catch up with him at the end of March to officially get it scheduled. Cause he said he had availability, but wouldn't know until closer to April, like what, what actual week would work best for him. So I need to contact him as far as I know, he's still game to do it. And I just need to contact him, double check. And then I'll get that on the schedule. Um, assuming he's still in for it, but that would be really fun. Either Sintel or agent three, two, seven, good suggestions. I, I mean, I don't see why I wouldn't do one of those two, um, in April. So thank you, Zach. Look at that direct suggestion. And I mean, without like, chaining myself to it i'm pretty sure it's gonna happen pretty cool um i really like all the streams that is awesome glad to hear that uh from a couple of you cool all right so we've laid out the uvs and uh it happened faster than i was expecting so that's great computer's still here it's not smoking stream appears to be going as well all right let's um now okay now that i've got my uvs laid out the way that I work again, because, and you've seen this in my, in my classes or my courses already. Uh, I really need to get those terms straightened out, but, um, I like to bake a, a few maps that help me with my texture painting process. So at the base layer, it's going to be color, right? Just pure color that I'm going to paint above that. I like a displacement map or, or a vertex, actually a vertex, uh, color map, um, dirty vertex color map as um, kind of like a high highlighting the bright and dark areas and then another ambient occlusion bake to to influence that um, the the darkness of the of the textures so i'm going to do that here as well and um part of the weirdest part of part of the weird thing with texture painting is setting up and i'm doing blender render just because it's what i've always done and i don't know that it's better than cycles or less confusing but when we go into texture paint um, for some reason, what is this? Oh, I've got, uh, I thought there was an AO texture already baked. Uh, I'm going to turn that shading ambient occlusion off screen space, ambient occlusion. And right away, we'll get the missing data, uh, warning up at the top. So this is, um, this is different from other courses that I've done where this was not the case. So this is also an effort to like try and correct some of those old courses that, um, that, you know, teach outdated you know, set up for these textures. So go into texture paint mode and notice the missing data. What it means is that there's no texture slots, which right here, um, there's no, oh, there's no material, nor are there material slots. So just click the add paint slot. I know it might not be completely obvious and add diffuse color. All right, this is, I'm gonna name um, base color. And I'm gonna do this 2048 by 2048 just just because I think that'll be more efficient. I would rather do a 4096 for more detail potential, but um, since I'm streaming, I'm gonna do it 2048. And uh, for the color, I'm just gonna make it like a kind of a gray. I know that's the suit color is somewhere in this in this realm. All right, so we'll create that. Once we do that, all the warnings go away and we have texture slots right here. Um, but yeah, it's confusing because as soon as I do that, I'm I no longer see the warning or anything about slots. I have to change tabs. And now I see that I've got my base color texture. This directly corresponds over here in the material tab, but you know, that's the material referenced up here, painting mode. And then the texture slots are right here mirrored. Um, base color, base color, you know, turning it on and off. Anyway, that's, that's confusing because it's two different spots to address the textures, but that's where they're sourcing from. And, um, and if I wanted to make, oh, well, I'll get there in a little bit. So that's texture number one. Texture number two, I'm gonna add another paint slot. It's also gonna be diffuse color. It's important to choose diffuse because that's that's where it's plugging into over here at the influence all the way down at the bottom, influence diffuse color. Okay, that's why it's important to know 
which texture paint you want. So diffuse color, this is going to be called um, this uh, dirty vert color. Or dirty vert, yeah, we'll just call it dirty vert color. And then I'm going to add one more diffuse color and AO. Okay. So they're all, and this is red um, opposite of Photoshop, where this this base color is the bottom of the stack, right? It's the pro, it's the first layer, and then this is number two, this is number three. So these on the bottom, visually the bottom, are going to be are going to influence over top of the others. Um, William Miller, are you using B Painter now? I'm not. No, this is stock Blender, so that's not. Um, yeah, I don't want to. Uh, it's a paid add-on, and it's it's more than worth the money. But um, because of that, I just I just try and use stock Blender. Another question: Would you recommend putting the entire character on one texture map, or would you separate uh, pieces of clothing? For the sake of what I'm doing, I just want I'm trying to make this as quick and dirty as possible. I have my sculpture, and I want to get into painting it as soon as possible. And for that reason, I'm just going to combine it all into one mesh, lay out the UVs, and go to town painting. Um, but it's there are a lot of problems with the efficiency of that or the texel density. Um, as you can tell, like if I tab into edit mode, um, or if I look at my UVs, um, there's a lot of empty space here. And that's just because the smart UV project is not the greatest. And um, yeah, it's definitely not the greatest. And so it's wasteful. And so what I, what I know in that situation is just make the texture bigger in resolution and that should take care of, of the empty space. But it's not the most efficient thing in the world. But again, I'm just trying to get into texture painting as quick as possible. Um, question, is lighting, beauty shot, camera placement, composition? Oh, you already asked that. Sorry, I mean, I already looked at that one. Is there a big difference? Okay, I must've gone further than I thought. Um, Sorry, just trying to catch up real quick with what you guys are saying. Yeah, I would love for Blender to have an auto topology thing. I'm trying to convince Jonathan Williamson to to do that as part of uh, Retopo flow. But I think it's pretty complex. Um, all right. I th okay, I think I'm caught up. I really scrolled down in those comments or in the uh, chat pretty quick. All right. Um, sorry, I'm making pretty slow progress, I know, but um, so I've got my three uh, texture slots set up and now I wanna bake an ambient occlusion and bake a dirty vertex color. And I'm doing this with Blender Render. So I'm gonna go to object mode and um, what was I doing? Okay, so I'm gonna do this in the, um, I don't really need this art down here anymore. Let's just get rid of that. No, I'll take it back. I'm gonna need it in a little bit. Um, let's, uh, at the bottom of the render panel, Sorry, I'm getting a little scatterbrained. Um, there is a bake option, and this is where the bake's gonna happen. Um, I hope you guys, if no one's familiar with what baking is, um, feel free to ask questions. I know it can be a little bit of a weird concept, but after I do it, um, maybe it'll make more sense. If not, I'll be happy to explain it the best I can. But I wanna bake ambient occlusion, the lighting ambient occlusion information to a texture that will fit right into that slot. So to do that, I'm gonna change the bake mode to be ambient occlusion. And what's a little quirky about this is how to define which texture it's going to bake to. Um, the way you do this in Blender Render is to, and maybe in Cycles too, but at least in Blender Render is tab into, I take it back, I know it's not how you do it in Cycles. Uh, I'm gonna tab into edit mode here, select everything, and in the UV image editor, select, uh, I don't, I'm gonna select all my mesh elements there just to be safe, and choose our ambient occlusion map. Okay, so now I have told the bake algorithm by assigning it to these UVs, this is the texture you're gonna bake to, not any of the others. All right, so we've got ambient occlusion um, enabled. All right, uh, the margin I'm gonna to set to like three pixels and let's try baking. And no images or objects found to bake. I don't have it selected, okay. Gotta have it selected. Now let's bake. All right, you see the progress going? It's actually going pretty fast. Okay, great. Yeah, in shading the sci-fi helmet, um, matte baking. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't put that one. I go over baking in the um, uh, pancake hobo course as well, but I did not put the shading the sci-fi helmet in there. It's another good course. Lot of texture painting stuff in there. 
another good course for texture painting. I'm not trying to toot my horn. Um, try using dumb UV project. Yeah, there is a new, it is kind of, um, oh, sorry, I thought you were making a joke that it's it's actually not as smart as it should be because a new add-on came out that does a much better UV packing uh, thing. And um, I thought that was a joke you were making. Uh, awesome, so the bake happened. Let's, um, it might be confusing because we don't see any any visual um, uh, evidence of this. And so you can, if you want to see it in object mode, we can switch to texture viewport shading. And there's our ambient occlusion bake. We can also look at it in the UV image editor. There it is right there, AO. Okay, so that's the bake that we've got. Um, the settings for this are in the world tab um, under ambient occlusion. Even though that's not enabled, it's still sourcing the settings from the ambient occlusion and the environment indirect lighting up in here. So, um, I'm sorry, in the gather, right? So ambient occlusion, um, actually just ignore that entirely. The, the samples, you see how noisy it is? Um, that is because of this sample right here under gather. All right, that's set to five. If I set this to like 16, it'll be much cleaner. Also the distance, the attenuation, um, it's set to 32.8 feet. I think, I can't remember what I put it to in my rehearsal. It was like, um, like 0.2 feet, 0.1 foot, maybe 1.2 inches. Let's try that. And I know it's confusing, like it's grayed out. Why would you ever think that these settings are relevant when they're grayed out this way? Um, and why are they under here and not under ambient occlusion? A lot of weird little quirks. Um, so I, yeah, that's just kind of part of it. So now that I've set those up, I can do a better ambient occlusion bake. Let's do that again. I'll take a little bit more time. Uh, looking through, yeah. Um, so there is like baking is a term that's used in multiple areas. It is used for animation. It's used in simulation. It's used in texturing. Uh, and that, I think that's the only three that I'm aware of. Particles, which is also simulation. But yeah, um, baking in a sense is, is for all those different subjects is like taking a bunch of data and like compounding it into a much simpler static form, right? So like this ambient occlusion is static. It's a texture and it will never move. You know, like the, it'll always be dark in these exact crevices. In simulation, like you bake it and you can't change those settings anymore. It's like those settings are static. So that's kind of the concept of baking, taking complex data and compounding it into a much simpler form. Um, I think that's a decent explanation. But um, see if I miss anything else. Oh, sweet. We got the bake pretty good. Um, yeah, so it's a much cleaner bake. And th by decreasing the... Um, attenuation, like I'm concentrating the shadows a little tighter and that's what I wanted. So like now the wrinkles are a little more obvious and you know, it's not, it's not an overpowered ambient occlusion effect. Now, typically ambient occlusion is from white to black, but by default with blender, it's like a gray to black. And, and if you want white to black, like just enable normalized right here in the bake settings that will make it white to black. But I want to leave it gray because now if we go back to texture paint mode, I'm going to, uh, disable dirty vertex and uh, um, change AO to be the blend type to be overlay. And crap, nothing happened. What about add? Nothing happened. Multiply, nothing happened. Confusing point number 37 um, about texture painting in here. So I want it to be a blend mode, but in order to get the blend mode to work, I need to enable shading instead of multi-texture, I need to enable GLSL. Okay, but then it goes black and I get nothing. Multiply, mix, add. Well, you need to change the shader to either be shadeless, which I'm gonna do that. Now we can see the result and I can change the overlay. There's no shading information whatsoever now. Um, if you want to paint with shading information, what you need to do is disable shadeless and add a light source, okay? This is why it's very confusing to set up texture painting in Blender. I'm gonna set up a hemisphere. Now that I've got a light source, we can see our texture information. It makes sense why it would need a light source, but I mean, how many hoops do we have to jump through? It's very confusing. Um, so 
I'm going to do it shadeless, right? I mean, I'll leave the hemisphere on there in case I want to switch back, but I'm going to leave it shadeless. And now we can see how in texture paint mode, our layers are working. All right, so ambient inclusion as an overlay, maybe soft light, make it a little more subtle. Um, now, if I want to decrease the overall effect of the ambient inclusion, I don't do that here. I go over to the texture panel and all the way down at the bottom, make sure that I have AO selected because that does not correspond. I can have a, I can have base vertex, base color selected over here, but AO selected over here, you know. Um, so make sure you have the right texture selected, go all the way to the bottom and change the color value to like 0.5. And now it's 0.5 the strength. And, um, and while these are a lot of hoops to jump through, I don't mean to trash Blender at all for this. Like I do my texture painting in here, it's just, a big learning curve for getting started. It is a, a, a you can create these textures very well. Um, I don't mean to trash it. I know that it could, could just sound like me complaining, but I don't mean to do that. Um, question, why would you, what would you use a spec map for? Okay, um, a specular map is, okay, it, yeah, if I turn off, right now, this the shaded version is no specular whatsoever, all right? So that, that spec is not happening. If I turn off shadeless, you see all these highlights? That is what's specular. It's the reflection of light off of the surface. And um, a specular map would be used to control, like let's say the, the um, this is a good example, like clothing, like fabric, uh, cotton fabric, for example, does not have a lot of specular on it, right? So the face, our human face does, or the hair has specular. So if, a, if I use a spec map, I would paint the clothing black to mean no specular, and then the face like a gray closer to white value to mean, yes, this has specular properties. That's why you would use a spec map. Question, what about those baking artifacts? Do you just fix them by painting over them? Yeah, I am gonna have to fix it that way. Um, it's like in the ear, like that's really annoying. Um, but overall, like, Keep in mind, if I'm going to present this or put it on my portfolio, um, you know, it, if I want to be this close to the model, then that's a big deal. But if I'm going to be showing like full body shots to illustrate like how it, it you know, represents the artwork, full bodied artwork, then it's the artifacts aren't that big of a deal. So it just depends on how you want to present it. But there are artifacts and they are annoying uh, when I do it this way. But uh, like this one right here is a big one, but I'll, that'll quickly paint out. If I just go to ambient occlusion, texture paint, tools, and choose, let's see, I need to choose the gray value. So I'm trying to color source. How am I gonna do that? How about, uh, all right, so what I'm trying to do is, is to fix that dark area, I want to color source the light area of the ambient occlusion map. This might get confusing. Um, but if I color pick by holding S, wait a minute, actually it is choosing the ambient occlusion. Look at that, that's brilliant. Okay, so it's not actually picking the visual color that we see on screen right now, but holding S brings up the color picker and it's choosing that gray value of the map, the ambient occlusion map. That's awesome. So now that I've color picked it, Let's just paint that out a little more carefully. Actually, I'm gonna get my pen because that's really what we should be painting with. Make sure that I, um, okay, yeah, my pressure sensitivity is enabled. Just paint that out. There we go. Small price to pay, you know, big picture, but then I can hold S, color pick right there, paint those out. Color picking being very important, something that we'll want to do a lot. S, S. All right, so those artifacts are diminishing very quickly that way. Um, yeah, it, it can be much better, but it, yeah, Omar, to your point, like it can be much better. I'm trying to say that it can be better, but also it's a very useful tool um, at the same time. Um, I wonder how, I always wonder how developers think, like if they watch tutorials and hear people say, oh, the particle system sucks or texture painting is, is garbage. Like that's gotta be offensive, you know, to them a little bit. And that's not really nice. Um, 
we need some Fresnel up in here. I've been watching Shader Forge a lot lately. Fresnel is is super important. Now, since I'm doing shading, shadeless, it's actually not as important. Actually, not at all because there is no shading information. But if there were, sh if this was shade full uh, texturing, then yeah, I would be crushing the Fresnel for sure. Question, with the pin and pressure sensitivity, does changing the strength do anything? I was having trouble with that when I was trying to learn sculpting. Yes, it does. So if I wanna, for some reason, paint a blue streak, well, I'll just, I'll start um, like with the hair, for example, it's an orange. Let's switch this image down. This, this is the reason I kept this, was to switch to our artwork because um, it's very useful to source directly from the art. By the way, does anyone know how to get rid of how to get rid of the UV overlay in the UV image editor. I feel like I've done that, but I just cannot remember how to do it. If anyone remembers, let me know. Um, Cause that's annoying. I am gonna also pin it by clicking that button. So that way it's always gonna be this art. Um, oh, William Miller, goodbye. Have a good one, sir. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, appreciate the participation. Uh, am I missing something? Yeah, so back to the strength of the pressure sensitivity. Um, so let's pick an orangish color for the hair. Maybe this one right here. Make sure that I'm on my base color slot, which I am. And my strength is set to one, right? But it's also, so it's set to full strength, but the pressure sensitivity means I can go below one. So if I lightly touch, I'm not getting one. But if I press hard, I'm getting one, okay? And so that's how it, it affects at full strength, but if I go to like 0.5, that means that full pressure will only be 0.5 strength, right? But I can still be even softer, okay? So that's like with shift F, that's kind of where pressure sensitivity works relatively. Um, it's very powerful. Um, but it, where it can be kind of annoying is when I want to paint like a full strength color, um, with my pen, what I'll do is is put the strength at one and then turn off pressure sensitivity. That way I know I'm painting 100% uh, of the strength. And that looks more red than orange. Anyway. Um, all right, so I'm not really ready to get there. So where am I at in this whole process? Barely done anything. Okay, there's one more map that I wanna bake. I'm gonna go to object mode and actually switch to V for vertex paint mode. And then in here, I'm gonna to go to paint. I'm gonna change it instead of from, in the viewport shade, I'm gonna go from textured to solid. And then I'm gonna change, or I'm gonna pick paint, dirty vertex colors. And depending on how dense your mesh is, that'll take a few seconds to maybe a minute. And while it might be hard to tell what's going on here with the shaded version, uh, what it's doing is kind of highlighting our our edges and darkening um, in the crevices. That's kind of what Dirty Vertex is doing. And I find that to be a very useful uh, utility texture bake to kind of get some of the highs and lows of shadeless texture painting very quickly, right? So I've got that um, as Dirty Vertex colors, but I need to now bake that to a texture. So I'm gonna go back to object mode and or uh, edit mode from there with everything selected let's let's assign the dirty vertex color map okay so i've assigned that now and in the baking options let's change from ambient occlusion to vertex colors margin 3 pixels should be good let's bake that shouldn't take too long it's going to transfer that vertex color information into texture format excellent and now if I go to, let's switch this back to the artwork while I'm thinking about it. There's the art. Texture paint mode. Yeah, I would love to get rid of those UVs, if anybody knows. Because I don't know how to just turn those off. I don't think there's a way. If someone knows, please let me know. All right, so in the texture slots, what we've, uh, um, okay, I need to go to texture uh, texture viewport shading. All right, now dirty vertex color, let's turn that on. And you can see what that looks like by itself if we turn off AO. Pretty cool feature um, for getting, you know, like on the wrinkles in the fabric, like 
we just see that detail popping in with highs and lows. And that's, that's, that's a nice map to have in your back pocket. So in the dirty vertex slot, let's change that to be an overlay or uh, maybe a little so more subtle, soft light. And now with ambient occlusion over top, we're, we're on our way. We've, you know, kind of cheated the process and we've got some, some painterly beginnings, right? Um, if we want to use them, they're there. And now we can just, I don't know, it kind of fast tracks the process for someone like me who doesn't. Um, I think you have to go into edit mode and deselect everything. Oh, I thought that was it. I thought that was, I thought you were right about that, Zach. Um, I guess when I'm in texture paint mode, they have to be visible. Bummer, that would be nice to turn off. Wait. There it is, view, draw texture paint UVs. Nice, there it is kind of hidden hidden in there. All right, cool, so now I, I have access to the art. The reason I want that is, you know, if I wanna select the color of his of his skin, for example, let's, let's start to paint that, I can just color pick it. So go to tools and let's color pick that right over there. So now I'm being very authentic to the art, at least as a starting point. And thus we all learn together. Amen to that. Um, so how I'm going to kind of, you know, like I think of Microsoft Paint or in Photoshop when you like do the paint fill, you know, like drop, fill a selection, an entire color. We can do that in Blender if we, um, in texture paint mode, if I enable this button right here, let's see if I can get the tooltip to show up. Face selection masking. All right, I'm gonna turn that on. And now I have edit mode selection tools. Um, so if I hit L, well, um, first right now when it's gray and you see the wireframe, that means nothing is selected and I can't paint anything, right? So I'm painting on the surface, but nothing's happening. If I hit L on this hand, now it's not wireframed and that means I can paint on it. All right, so this is how I'm sort of masking which areas of the mesh I'm gonna paint. And now that I've done that, let's um, change the brush to be fill. We'll change the strength up to one and for whatever reason, you can see I'm filling in the color, but it doesn't do it 100%. Um, and I've never known why. I, I don't understand why. Like I've got strength to one, the pin pressure sensitivity is not an issue, but as I, you know, I keep pressing it, keep pressing it, and then eventually it fills to the full color. Um, if I turn, let me turn off these colors. Yeah, so, huh, interesting. Um, so think about this, like as I reveal that, um, I'm, I color picked this. Is that the, that doesn't look like the same color, does it? As I push the hand closer over here. Oh, oh, I think I know why. Let me undo that. So I think I filled that color on dirty vertex colors instead of the base color. Yeah, that's what I did. So you gotta be aware, you gotta be very cognizant of which texture slots you have enabled. Um, is it anything to do with the mix type? Let me go to tools. I mean, it's set to mix. So like that should be 100%. Let me, maybe this alpha bit, I don't know what that's necessarily about. I'm gonna select this other hand. And yeah, I don't understand why, it, but it's always done that. Um, as far as I know, it's kind of weird. All right, let's, um, but that's the process for now. So I'm gonna deselect everything with the A button. These are the same hotkeys as in edit mode or object mode. And let's L to select my shirt and let's change that to white. Just, uh, um, and another thing, you can't swap these colors whenever in fill mode for some reason, fill brush. So I gotta switch to texture draw and then press X to switch the color back to fill. Just little quirks like that, that make it very funky to work with. All right, so I've got that. Let's select everything. And, and you can see now that we're starting to advance our, our general color information and uh, just blocking it in at this point. But since we've got those overlays, we're getting some information for free and it's, it's, it's looking a little more painterly than if, if, it, was, if it didn't have those, those, uh, those map bakes. So they're helping us in this situation. Cool. 
Um, let me try and fill a few more spots like the mask. Let's go hit A to deselect everything. And remember the selection only works if you've got this enabled, this little button down here. Um, yeah, the blend. Okay, don't see any questions. Cool, so I'm gonna select the mask and let's choose an orange color. We can try and color pick, but just be aware that the types of, of overlay masks that we're using might affect that and not give you exactly what you color pick. So we'll go to fill and press it several times. See, that's way too saturated. So maybe we'll go down in saturation. All right, that's a little more ballparked. And then for the head, let's um, go back to the um, skin color and let's fill. All right, we've got the skin started. And now I can probably start painting out the hair like because that doesn't have a mesh specifically, I need to go in with my brush, texture draw, and actually um, start painting um, by hand. So we'll pick just a brownish type color. Desaturate it a bit because these overlays are gonna increase saturation typically. Um, all right, and we're gonna make turn off pressure sensitivity for the strength. We'll make it. Oh, we'll make it one, and we'll start. Oh, that's not it. Let's get it a little more orange. All right, that's a good starting point, I suppose. One of the bummers is the fact that I don't uh, have symmetry anymore on the head. I don't think. Let's see. Let's double check it. Options. Wait a minute. I thought there was. I thought there was. Um, I thought we had at this point a symmetrical texture painting. Do we not have that? Huh. I thought we did. Maybe if someone can above brushes, thank you. Goober. Um, all right, there we go. Yeah, so it's not the symmetry I was hoping for. Some At some point that got lost. Bummer. Didn't think that went through. Um, so I'm just painting this by hand like a scrub. Scrub seems to be my um, self-insult of the day. But what I like about this approach, being being a not particularly gifted painter um, and impatient person, is like I'm painting this single color, but thanks to the overlays, I'm getting some dark and light values, and I like that a lot. It just uh, helps, it's like a cheat, a hack. If Tim were here, I wonder if he would just be like rolling over, like, you just suck, man. That's just an excuse. You don't know how to paint well. Anyway, all right, we've got about 10 minutes left in the stream. I appreciate anyone who's been able to stick with me through this. This demonstration, I don't know if it was helpful at all, but um, clearly I did not get much done. What I do want to do in the last 10 minutes is actually do more than just paint solid color. I want to paint some like highs and low values, try and act like a painter for a bit. I'm going to finish up the head real quick, the hair. And uh, go from there. All right, so some things to keep be aware of is as I paint from this angle, you can see where it looks like I've covered that whole area, but then as I rotate around, you know, it's a very strict fall off, very strict edge in the color. And that's from the projection settings. Um, so for project paint in normal, if I change that to like 40, let's try that again, step back. And what you should see, is, yeah, you can see that I'm painting on this side, but it's like automatically decreasing the strength and it's making that projection less um, harsh, right? So the normal uh, it option in the project paint can be 
helpful in eliminating those really straight, uh, harsh fall offs. I'm also holding control to paint out the skin, like to go back and forth from those. Like holding control will enable the secondary color. But also once I get up in here, it can be hard to actually paint the whole surface with that normal setting. So what I'll do is just turn them all off and then it'll project all the way through the mesh. So make sure you don't have anything on the other side that you don't want painted. But in this case, I know that I can just paint this whole thing and it'll be fine. And I'll fill in everything without a doubt. Nothing's being occluded. And you can see that we're getting some artifacts that are just from the UVs being so dirtily laid out. But I mean, I mean from here, it doesn't really register that much. All right, so that's kind of painting that. We're starting to get some color on. Just basic colors, obviously a lot more shading. Um, variety in the orange needs to happen. Um, and so I wanna start that on the foot. That's the one that I rehearsed, so I feel most comfortable doing that one in the last 10 minutes. Um, can you not, a question, let's see, can you not mask off what you don't want to paint on the same mesh? Yeah, you can. Um, I think in, in the context of the head, like that's what I've actually been doing. So right, like if I wanna sculpt on just the face, it's it's based on mesh islands and, um, or, or the mask, for example, I hit L just over this object and I'm only painting on that object. Um, so that's in a way masking, but also if I want to save the file, Omar, is this worth saving? I don't know, uh, but I, I will do that. <laughs> um, it brings up a good point actually. Um, I'm gonna do that next, Omar. Um, so with the masking, I can also tab into edit mode. This is just where it gets, a, since it's such a high density mesh, um, I could circle select or, you know, however you want to select a certain, you know, bit of polygons. Let's say this, um, but you can see how slow it is. And that's why I haven't been doing it. Um, so I can select that, go back to object mode, or I mean texture paint, and I'm only painting on those faces. So you can select very specific uh, selections of your mesh, but I just find it easier to, you know, like I've broken apart, well, I sculpted my, my character in different pieces and that's made it, um, easier to, uh, texture paint it in this way, just by masking off individual islands. Uh, so yeah, saving, that's a good point. I'm going to hit shift control S to bring up the save menu. And there's actually saving the file. I'm not doing that much because the texture is where the actual work is happening, but I'm going to save the file, just be aware that that's not taking your texture information with it by default. So I'm going to go to text paint. Here's my rehearsal file. Let's just remove the rehearsal. Texture paint 01. Save as blender file. Um, so if you think you've saved your textures, you have not. And that is a common issue that people run into. Go to your UV image editor and in if you have any of your textures selected, base color, dirty vertex, the things you've been painting on, you can see in this image uh, menu, there's a little star. That means that your file has unsaved changes. So I need to go to image, save as image, and we'll go, and I, I have a folder for textures and I'm gonna call it just base color PNG, just save it as is what I named it. And I'm gonna, uh, I don't really need the, I don't, I don't need the, uh, uh, alpha channel, so I'm gonna just hit RGB, save as image, and then go to the next texture file, dirty vertex, same thing, save as image, and um, RGB, save as dirty vertex color, and then the last one is AO, image, save as image, AO, PNG, RGB, there we go. Now I'm safe. Now I've got all my textures saved, I've got my file saved. And from now on, the saving process, I'll have to do that. I'll have to um, come into the, if I want to save my file and my textures uh, down the road, I've got to save the individual images, okay? Because um, they're only being sourced into this Blender file. They're not living in the Blender file. They are living on your hard drive. Um, I have a hard habit of hitting Control-S three or more times. Oh man, I do that too. I mean, 
there it's not uncommon i'll hit control save and then i'll orbit around control save again yeah no that's just a that's a 3d artist twitch nothing wrong with it what is the difference between 8-bit and 16-bit you were asking the wrong person but we do have a i recommend the article that jonathan limpel wrote okay well in a, in a small sense i know what it is 8-bit is like less pixel information. 16-bit has more pixel information, more color information. So um, more data just means it's more robust. It's got more going for it. 8-bit um, is is more compressed. There's less about it. So it, like that's in a general principle, right? Like a 16-bit or a 32-bit operating system versus a 16 or 64-bit. 64 can do more. Um, and so what I recommend is the article. Let's go find that. It specifically has to do with normal maps, but he talks about the bit thing, uh, image bit level um, in there. Uh, where is it? This one right here, bit depth and how compression affects uh, normal maps. I recommend reading through this. It, it shows through the context of normal maps what bit depth does, but here, right here, understanding bit depth, uh, 16 bit have 65,536 colors per channel. 30 or 8 bit has to only 256 colors per channel. Look at that jump. 256 compared to 65,000. That's a huge difference with 60, uh, 16 versus 8. Um, but it does mean higher, a bigger file. So back to Blender, um, 8 bit file textures are just less. And so, like, if you're doing a game or something, or you need to save file space, like doing 8-bit is going to be less costly than doing 16-bit. Um, so that's, I default to 8-bit. I've, uh, I should probably get on the 16-bit bandwagon for um, higher quality stuff, but 8-bit has been fine for me. It's kind of like the baseline standard. Um, all right, we are quickly running out of time. I did want to show you um, my very limited painterly ability, more than just filling in with solid colors. So I'm going to go to the foot since that is what I uh, make sure that's the only thing I've selected that is what I uh, uh, rehearsed on earlier I'm going to start with a color source make sure I'm on base color and choose um, a brown in here there's a variety of brown that's a you know that's what I hope you find you learn from the the uh, what was it basics concept course that I recommended for this week, um, just how the variety of color gradients in in a certain color make painting like believable and good. You know, like when I say I'm going to pick the brown of the shoe, there is no the brown, right? Here's a lighter brown, here's a darker brown, here's a highlight. So I'm I'm just picking a brown from the shoe color, and that's what eventually I want it to look like in 3D as well. And you'll well, hopefully we'll get there in just a second. So I need it to be, I think it needs to be just lighter in general. And then I'm going to fill the shoe. And yeah, that's fairly close. I think I actually want to undo one of those fills. And now I'm back to the fill texture draw brush. And I'm going to pick a darker brown. And let's start to paint very, very lightly. I'm just going to start to make a gradient let me see what my projection settings are. Let's let's leave them off. Well, now I want them on. Um, occlude, call, and normal. And I'm going to start painting the bottom uh, a little darker. So now we finally entered the world of an actual painter, not not whatever that person was, just filling in colors and using baked maps. Um, I want to get rid of this other shoe. Where is that? There it is. All right, so yeah, just trying to fill this area in darker. Leave the top side lighter. Maybe fill in darker around the uh, uh, the p uh, pant leg. Wow, just for like some ambient occlusion sort of effect. And all right, so that's a little bit of darkness. Let's try going for a lighter now. Switch the color, and um, that might work actually. Or maybe a little more saturation towards a orange like this. 
All right, so I'm just going to touch the top sides, not quite that hard. And also anywhere for like wear and tear, like this wrinkle in the boot, I want to add a little bit more wear and tear to that. So I'll focus more of that color in there. Focus on the edges. Now the our map is doing a little bit for us. The dirty vertex is, is doing a little bit of this for us. But this is, you know, I can accentuate it a little bit more. Just give it some wear and tear on the edges. You know, very, very low key painter stuff. Tim Von Ruden, I hope you never watch this. Um, but I, I really do want to get better at this. Um, I just think it's a a good skill, especially for like in um, game art stuff, like being able to paint hand painted textures. Just a good skill to have big time. Um, all right, so that's kind of I want a little more dark in here. Holding control brings back my darkness. Brings back my darkness. Sounded particularly country and um i there is a little bit like i feel like a stronger saturation of orange in there as well so i'm gonna pick this orange color let's make it real subtle and like touch some areas really really subtle yeah just give it a variety of color all right and then for the bottom i think i just want to kind of make it a, a little bit of a lighter color the soul, I mean. So just concentrate my strokes there. And I don't really get that from the art. I just, it's more of an artistic decision to make this a little lighter. All right, and there we go. Like when it's close, you know, maybe it looks a little bit bad, but once we zoom out, I feel like it looks okay. You know, for a, a, um, a poor painter as myself, I think it ends up looking okay. Now imagine doing that, the point of the painterly style is treating the entire mesh, the entire model that way, right? So the pants have a variety of color. They also have pinstripes in the pants, which that's gonna be a nightmare. Um, but uh, once the whole thing is addressed that way, I think it's going to look pretty good. I, th I think the model will look um, will look authentic and fully realized. Uh, I think I've been missing some questions. Um, I'm going to answer those questions to end out the stream, but I do want to show, like, if I tab into edit mode, let's bring back my shoe, and I duplicate this now. Since it, it's a duplicate, it shares the same UVs, and I can... Let's switch back to my mouse... Um, I can just duplicate this, reposition it, and I get that for free. Oh gosh, I went into viewport rendering. That could have been disastrous. Um, rotate it around. All right, it's pretty much the same position. Though I need to move the ankle over with proportional editing. There we go. Tab back there, L, and finally flip direction. All right, now I can delete that old foot. All right, and when I go back to texture paint mode, we've got both. Um, we got both shoes textured. Awesome. Okay, so I'm sorry, that was that was not a, we didn't make a lot of progress in the demonstration, but um, hopefully it kind of gives you, you know, a kickstart. Um, but I'm really trying to get good at this, uh, get better at this hand-painted stuff. So that's the direction I wanted to go. You don't have to, you can go in the direction of the sci-fi helmet or the uh, pancake hobo and do shader-based uh, texturing. And I mean, that would be beautiful to, to see like fully, uh, you know, um, surface quality that interacts with the light and there's reflections and there's Fresnel. 
remember for now. Um, but yeah, choose if you want to do hand painted, if you want to do texture based, that's all good. Um, but uh, let me check if I've got questions. Let's see, question, is there a way to smooth the colors with a shortcut like Shift S or something? Oh yeah, um, I'm not sure about a shortcut other than just switching brushes because there is a, a soften brush. So you can see, I mean, maybe you can see how that works. It's pretty subtle since this is all the same color, but that is blurring. Hopefully you can see that there is smear that's a little more noticeable. Um, but those brushes do that that smoothing type effect. It'd be kind of cool if it was shift S like in sculpt mode, I agree. Um, quickly calls Tim on the phone, please don't. Uh, now, Tim's very nice and he'd be like, you did good Kent, you did good. But I would know he's like, just being nice. And it was embarrassing from a painter standpoint. Um, all right. Am I missing any other questions? I don't think so. Okay. Fresnel for Kent t-shirt quotes. Um, yeah, my favorite thing is there's a V-Ray short film. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Last thing we'll talk about. There's a short film from from about V-Ray. Oh, it was here. By the way, Lucas the Spider, we were talking about this channel in the pre-stream chat. Check it out if you missed that that portion of the chat. That portion of the chat. Very interesting. Also, it was just simple 30, 30 second animations from this person. Um, and they're like incredibly popular. So like if you ever want to figure out a seemingly very realistic way to make money doing <laughs> doing making income doing like just animation and, and computer graphics, like this guy has nailed it somehow. Um, and he seems pretty new. Anyway, Lucas the Spider, check it out. But what I wanted to show you was V-Ray, let's see, V-Ray short film. This one, V-Ray in real life. There's this awesome part where he talks about, it's like in the context of a, um, like a, a robbery or something yeah and there's this part where he slammed oh this is this where it is yeah 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 right come by you want to look real just make sure it has fernell everything has fernell if you want to make sure it looks real everything has fernell love that anyway watch that v-ray short film it's hilarious but to the point of fernell is is uh super important all right um Thank you for watching guys. That's gonna be it for today. And for the, that's the end of the live stream portion of the class. Uh, you, again, as a reminder, I would love to see your text, your characters textured fully and like with the presentation render. And since that's a lot to ask, you know, um, it, the deadline is extended to the end of the first week in April. Um, uh, and I'm gonna be present in that thread, checking back uh, in the community class thread till the end of April or to the end of the first week in April. And then we'll officially close out the class. But um, yeah, uh, but starting in April, we're, I'm going to go back to more kind of random uh, live stream topics as I prepare for the next class. And, uh, and we're starting out with a really exciting one um, t next week. Next Tuesday is going to be a, an artist study on an artist named Beeple. Um, he's an incredible artist and I cannot wait. One of my favorite, I can't wait to, like dive in and dissect exactly what he does as an artist and how we can learn from it and, and apply some of those things that we analyze. But anyway, that's going to be next week. It's going to be really, really cool. Also should be having a Captain Disillusion interview in um, April as well. And uh, yeah, so it's it, the fun continues stream wise, but the class is going to be over this. Uh, no more streams for this class. But thank you so much for being here and um, for hanging out in the chat. I hope you guys learned and um with that, make sure I'm ready to stop. Um, you guys have a good rest of your Tuesday, and I will see you around.